to speak. With us today is David Milligan, Executive General Manager of Pig and Swig Restaurant Group. Jamie Ream, President of Three Point Restaurant Group. Tom Allen, Executive Vice President at Cushman and Wakefield Sage Partners. Ben Sellers, Managing Partner, Pivot Project. Montine McNulty, the CEO of the Arkansas Hospitality Association. And Mark Ryan, Executive Vice President and Loans Manager for Arvest Bank. The facilitator of today's roundtable conversation is Clinton Bennett, President of Bennett Commercial Real Estate. Clinton, the floor is yours. Thanks, Wes. Thanks very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I say it's encouraging to be on with uh, a really talented field of people here. And it's great to hear some of Spencer's comments. I think um, certainly gives us some optimism for the future. We, we all know we've got a little bit of a tough road in front of us, but, uh, you know, we've got so much talent in this area and I think so much talent in this country that it's um, hard not to be optimistic about how we come out of this event. Um, we have one other guest that I think we're fortunate to have on the line. I'm, I'm not sure if she made it or not, but uh, Emily Rothkrug with the James Beard Foundation was able to kind of uh, make some changes last minute to join us today. So I don't know if Emily is available, but if so, I'd like to offer the floor to her to give her a few minutes to tell us what they're seeing on the front lines of the uh, changing environment in the restaurant industry. Yeah, thank you so much and thank you all for having me. Um, it's definitely an interesting time, challenging time for restaurants everywhere and that's something that we're, we're seeing at the James Beard Foundation um, where we just launched a new campaign called Open for Good, which is meant to support the independent restaurant community during, during this crisis. I think we're, we're looking at it in three phases. Um, survive, rebuild, and thrive. I think right now we're very much in the survival stage with some places that are getting into that sort of rebuilding phase. Um, and we've shifted a lot of our conversations to reopening. Um, but I think the, the major takeaway is that restaurants need relief. They need government relief and they need it immediately. They aren't getting it enough right now through PPP and any of these other things that are available for small independent businesses. Um, and this is a, an industry that contributed $899 billion in sales to the US economy last year. And so with a staggering number like that, the fact that industries like cruises and airlines who have contributed actually less to the US economy than restaurants have, they're all getting their own bailouts and restaurants aren't. Um, and so that's kind of our, our main way. And if we want to see these places stay open, um, then we're going to have to make some changes at, at the highest levels of our government pretty soon. Uh, but in the meantime, there are a couple of things that they're doing to sort of triage. One is switching to takeout and delivery, which, you know, shouldn't be news to anybody. That just given the state of these delivery services um, is maybe not a long-term sustainable option. They take a lot of commission from restaurants per sale. And so trying to not use that as a panacea for the issues that the restaurants are facing right now. Um, one thing that was already touched on a little bit is when they reopen is investing in this outdoor space uh, because in the reopening, in the states that have reopened, we're seeing that there are limits to how many people can restaurants are operating at limited capacity for indoor space but those restrictions are a lot looser for outdoor space um but still not not so much is known about transmission i think we're still trying to figure out how safe it is and restaurants really want to reopen safely uh, and there was a study that came out this morning actually I, I just looked at it like a couple hours ago that said that restaurants still need like three months to a year to feel that they can reopen safely. So even in states that are reopening, it, it can be really difficult. So there's gonna be a lot of these conversations around you know, how to design the spaces sustainably, how to use this kind of moment in time to make the restaurant industry as a whole more sustainable, um, because this is something that you know, restaurants have been talking about for a long time where it's, if you lose one day of sales, which is what happened with this pandemic, then some, sometimes you have to close permanently. And when you're operating on those razor thin margins that even one day of lost sales means that you have to close permanently, that's something wrong at you know, these, these very systemic kind of base levels. So 
really looking forward to using this as an opportunity to address some of these systemic issues in the restaurant and hospitality industry and um, rebuild bigger and better than ever. Well, thanks very much for your thoughts on that. I, we had, um, the, the group on the panel here had kind of uh, laid out a little bit of an agenda. So I'm going to, I'll, I'll tell everyone what we're thinking about, how, how we're planning to walk through that. And then um, I'm going to open the floor up to our participants as we, as we kind of go through that. But feel free to, you know, some of your comments, um, Emily hit on many of the points we laid out. So, you know, if we feel like, I'll leave it open to the, to the panel a little bit. If we feel like we want to focus on some of those, we will. But really, I wanted to start with just having a general discussion about what this experience has looked like. Um, you know, I know David is in the middle of operating restaurants. Jamie's in the middle of operating restaurants. Montine is, uh, you know, on the front lines with the hotel industry. Uh, I know Ben, Tom, and, and Mark, you know, Ben and Tom are kind of looking at it from a landlord perspective, and they're, you know, in, on the, in daily conversations with me and their tenants, and, um, you know, it may not be the, the tenants. Um, they're certainly separate businesses, but I know I speak for Tom for sure that, you know, he, he, he considers them partners and is very concerned about their businesses. So he's kind of on the front lines in a way. And then Mark, you know, we'd like to visit a little bit about financing. So I want to, I'll try to speed up a little bit, but I want, so I wanted to kind of talk about what the experience has been like. Uh, and then I wanted to get into kind of the economic side, because I know everyone on the, uh, I think most of the attendees here are interested in kind of the financial economics, how it, uh, impacts tenants and property owners. And then I want to kind of uh, progress to what does reopening look like? And, um, you know, one of the things that's particularly interesting to me is, is what these outdoor spaces look like. Um, you know, I saw Daniel Hintz was on the attendee list. I wish he could participate because he's so passionate about the experience economy. And, um, you know, it's tough to how, how are we going to continue to have these experiences that we've really worked for decades now to, to create. Um, so I'll try to stop rambling here, but I'd like to kind of open the floor to David and then maybe Jamie and Montine to talk about what what it's been like trying to operate in this just kind of uh, environment that none of us expected or could have predicted. Well, I can tell you from our perspective, those of you who don't know what Pig and Swig does, we operate a lot of different types of food service facilities. So the experience has been really different. We have Tuscan Trotter restaurant, which is a brick and mortar, uh, casual dining, no opportunity for patio seating at all. And it's basically operating at about 10% of sales with uh, takeout and delivery. Then we have Trash Creamery, which is an ice cream shop, which has actually done better in sales, but we've been giving the ice cream away free and doing a donation model for people. If they want to donate to help cover our costs, they can or then you can just come in and get free ice cream. So part of that was a uh, thought that we could reach out to the community and provide something that was uh, something fun in this time. And also because of the way that place is structured, we could just uh, give ice cream out of the front door. No one even comes in the place. So we could actually operate it safely. Uh, we took all the outdoor seating away so people couldn't sit next to each other. And we actually take it out to their cars after they order. Then we have a place we open in the middle of all this, which is uh, we do the food service at uh, Bentonville Brewing Company, which is at our place, Bird de Gustro Pub. And that place opened two weeks ago and is exceeding all our expectations because they have a huge patio and we don't have servers. So they just, they can order online and then we call them when their food's ready, they pick it up at the window and we have very little customer contact and it's going great. So we've seen kind of all ends of the spectrum. We also had two places we were getting ready to sign leases on. Uh, one of which we've already done all the architectural work and design work and spent all that money down in North Little Rock and then another one here in Rogers. And they're just sitting there on the table, aging <laughs> for now till we see what this looks like. Uh, so we've had, and also the people who own Pig and Swig also own a lot of real estate. So they're also landlords. So we're kind of involved in it from every angle there is. Hey, thank you, David. Um, 
That's very interesting. That's the first I've heard of a donation model, but I'm glad to hear that that's going well for you guys. That seems like a, a really uh, creative and entrepreneurial way to, to try to trudge through this. Uh, Jamie, would you like to talk a little bit about what you guys have experienced? Jamie uh, is in a little more of the QSR business, but I'll let him speak to that. Yeah, sure, definitely. You know, Three Point Restaurant Group, we, we own and operate uh, a handful of concepts in about a four state region uh, from California to Kansas, Missouri, and Arkansas, most notably Freddy's Frozen Custard and Steak Burgers and, and Slim Chickens. And, um, you know, we, we're really fortunate as, as everything kind of moved through us, uh, we, we had drive-through windows. You know, even though the majority of our business was not conducted through the drive-through, uh, typically in, in the Freddy's side, we, on average, were about 60% dine-in and uh, about 40 percent drive-through on average and our model with frozen custard being a uh, um, you know just an add-on really to the meat of our business with steak burgers and, and and hot dogs and french fries we 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 really our model's built for dining it's not really built for drive-through you know when was the last time that you can think of going through and getting uh, a number one in a drive through and then you got a big old Sunday or concrete that you're going to follow it up and hopefully you got to eat it fast for it not to be melted. Well, um, now our model had to shift. Everything was so fluid. I mean, every day was a different day for us. We didn't, we didn't know what the rules, what the regulations were going to be. We were just, you know, very thankful that, that we had the opportunity to, to still serve our guests through that drive through window. And we learned a lot. We learned a lot very fast you know when the majority of our business and, and freddie's coming through the dine-in it's not like we we didn't focus on our drive-through it's not like we didn't care about our drive-through but it, you know we were we're going in a lot of different directions and you throw custard in the mix too and um, i think within the first week uh, you know we really dialed in our drive-through operation and from timing to uh, you know different protocols that we had to put in place not only to keep our our guest safe but also our employees you know that was a that's a big concern of ours as we continue to operate we were never shut down you know on the slim side either we were we were never shut down through this whole thing and we were you know we, we implemented calls starting at uh, eight o'clock every morning all of our top level drill managers uh, started at with freddy's at eight slims at 8 30 and and you know executive after that and we were on top of it every day with our employees we were making sure that all protocols all safety all cleanliness, cash handling. It took a lot more labor to, to do what we need to do to, to stay safe. And, um, you know, we, we took it very serious and, and we became very efficient. And, I, you know, I hopefully I, I think all of our guests uh, can see that and what we do and how we do it. But um, it, it changed the ball game. It honestly did. And as we continue to move through this, it, it's something that we, we evaluate every day and, and say, man, you know, if we get back to opening dining rooms right now in several of our states, we have the opportunity to, we're sitting, we're sitting tight right now, uh, you know, at 25% occupancy. We, we just don't, we don't think it's there yet. We, we want to, we want to see our, our guests and our consumers want it a little more, uh, feel a little more comfortable, even though we're taking, you know, everything that we possibly can to make sure everybody is, is safe and spending the extra dollars to do that internally. It just is, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we're really focused on drive through. We're moving drive through, uh, through, and in a time frame that we've never really seen before, and everything is going really good for us. Uh, you know, sales wise, of course, when you take sixty percent of dine in sales, and all of a sudden it's not there, and we, we gradually built it up, and and the demand was there too. The pent up demand was there uh, as full service restaurants weren't able to really you know, open their doors, uh, except for a little takeout and, and delivery, you know, it's been on who has technology. That's another thing that has really helped us out is, is technology. So not just drive through, but online ordering, uh, being able to have an app on your phone, have the, the social media aspect of marketing, being able to understand third party deliveries, have that integration. I mean, I, uh, I was talking to a lot of operators and a lot of brands and they're calling like, hey, how do I get DoorDash or how do I get Grubhub, you know, and, and man, good luck calling them. You might be on wait for a couple of days, but, uh, you know, we, we were lucky. We were lucky in a lot of different ways to have the opportunity to still serve food and also have the opportunity to have the technology on our side. And that's 
that's really what has has helped us through this. Obviously, there's a lot of the unknowns that we we never knew uh, from day one to today. We still don't know, you know. And one of the reasons why at 25% occupancy we're taking our time to open our lobbies is I still feel like there's a risk. There's a risk out there, and we cross our fingers. We we we've, we've done everything possible that we can to keep our employees safe, but the minute one of our employees comes down and tests positive, um, man, <laughs> you know, it changes the dynamic for 24, 48 hours, depending on the jurisdiction, depending on the health department needs to come out. We have to do deep cleans. And, and so I'd, I'd rather not open up the lobbies until we get 50, 75% and we, we feel the demand, you know, we, yeah, we, we have guests that come and are, are mad because we're not open one or two a week or something like that. But then we we're getting ready to start marking off our patios, you know, every other table, we got social distancing stickers and, and everything else that we need. And, and we're preparing to open our lobbies and it's not going to be cheap. We're estimating somewhere around four to $5,000 a unit to do all the plexiglass to have all the social distancing. I mean, Currently, we have thermometers in every one of our restaurants before every shift. Our, our manager on duty is temping all of our employees. And if, if, if you know, I think it's 100.4. And if someone is over, they get sent home right away. No, no questions asked. And all the other symptoms as well. So for us, it's not just about it is very important for us to protect our employees, protect our guests, but also protect the business. You know, I think we have a really good thing going right now and, and we're lucky, we're lucky to have this, but we need to be safe. Uh, and that's our, that's our number one priority right now is making sure that everybody's safe. Well, thanks. Thanks for telling us about your experience. <laughs> that's encouraging to hear that, uh, you know, the drive throughs have provided a bright spot. It sounds like you guys have navigated fairly well, even though it's been amidst some real challenges. Montine, uh, could you tell us uh, what you've seen in the hotel industry and what you're hearing from your constituents? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Good. Um, I first wanted to say I'm not just hotel industry. The Arkansas Hospitality Association is the restaurant association, the lodging association, and the travel association, all under one umbrella in Arkansas, and it works very well. Um, it's really interesting because I, I was involved in the state parks and tourism beginning about 33 years ago. We had no money and we had to be very smart and do really well with money. And some of the things that I've heard today, I, I can remember discussions about about Arkansas being a value and how we had to take advantage of that. And price was really important, but also quality. And where our state has come from in terms of developing product in Arkansas and developing the trails and the outdoors and the things to see and do, I think in the long term are going to to bode very well for our state. Um, I can tell you where I've been the last six weeks and it's been sitting at my desk in an empty office with no one else, having all the phones going to my cell phone and I answer every call and I'm, you know, stunned by what's being faced by our industry, restaurant, hotel, and travel our convention centers and the travel business. And it's really overwhelming, but I'm, I'm so glad to have heard Mr. Levy today and his optimism um, because it may help me. Um, there are so many out there that need help financially. And uh, that's what I try to work on every day. Uh, there were some major things that happened on the federal level yesterday with American Hotel and Lodging and AHOA sending letters to Congress. And um, we, they talked about the CMBS loans and there, there are hotels in real jeopardy today about losing um, their hotels and the financing, all that's a key thing, both on the, on the restaurant and the lodging side. And it's something that I work, work on every day. Um, 
I do think that some of the things we've talked about as far as the safety and the air quality and using the outdoor space for restaurants is going to be really important to the future. Um, I'm also on the, the uh, governor's committee to open up the industry. And so much of what I've been doing is answering questions about that, helping to develop guidelines and um, just trying to, to help people with their everyday lives today. But um, we've got a big challenge in front of us, but Arkansas has so much going for it. Um, I do think we're going to be that drive to state. We're going to be the safer state we can play up the value. And I can tell you that the Department of Parks and Tourism, uh, we had a commission meeting this morning and went over the advertising schedule first to advertise to Arkansans and try to get them back in and traveling. And then ultimately in a couple of months, uh, open it up to out of state travelers. But um, there, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, struggle going on out there. We've got to find some financial uh, solutions. And I think it will come from the federal level. I don't know about the state level, but uh, we've got to find something along those lines. But our future can look very bright if we can get by these initial hurdles. Thank you. And, and I'll just say a personal thanks for all your work. The, the tourism industry in the state is certainly a source of pride and a lot of fun to, it's a lot of fun to enjoy our, our outdoors and see the progress that's been made over the last few decades. Well, and I don't know if everybody realizes that, but when this happened, we, we had been, our revenue for the state had been breaking records month over month and year over year our industry has been leading the economy in Arkansas and leading the job growth in Arkansas. So um, our state's very dependent upon this industry and, and having it be successful. And we've got to keep reminding our, our leaders about that. Thank you. Well, Tom and Ben and Mark, I'd like to try to shift a little bit to what the front lines look like from a, from a real estate and kind of financing perspective. Um, you know, I think we can kind of talk over each other. You guys can grab the floor and talk. Uh, uh, I'll let you handle it how you want, but I know you've, you've all been in some difficult conversations uh, and, and probably some encouraging ones. So um, I'll turn it over to you guys. Thanks, Clinton. Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm with Pivot Project Development in Oklahoma City. And, you know, we're pretty hyper-local uh, development firm. We're, we're focused solely on the city. And all of our food and beverage tenants are locally owned groups, that, you know, the smaller mom and pop type operations. Uh, like was discussed earlier with Spencer, you know, we've been working with all of our tenants on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We have um, some paying no rent, some paying triple net, some paying some percentage, you know, and all of our uh, our local bankers have been really good to work with, with, with those deferrals. Um, we've got a few, few tenants that, you know, are totally closed, but most of them are, have been operated on the to go or curbside type model as, as we've kind of seen nationwide. Uh, in Oklahoma, one thing that's helped some of our tenants is the, uh, the alcoholic beverage licensing commission here in the state, uh, relaxed some of its rules and had been allowing packaged alcohol sales. So we've had some bars and restaurants that have, you know, been able to supplement a little income by selling bottles of wine to go and to install some of those uh, relaxed rules permanently, but I think that's yet to be determined. Uh, we're also uh, looking at the expanded patio situation and, and, and as mentioned previously by someone else, we've got a few tenants who are setting up picnic tables and whatnot on sidewalks and parking lots and things like that. Um, to expand some of their, their seating options and, and all of our tenants and even, even the local food operators uh, in our city that in, in, in other properties are, are operating really out of an abundance of caution, even though they can open their dining rooms at 25% capacity, a lot of them still haven't done that. And they're, they're being more cautious. And um, 
you know, we're all trying to understand the data and the health risk. And there's so much different information coming from so many different sources um, as landlords and tenants both trying to you know, just make sure we're, we're not putting anybody at risk. Uh, and being hyper-local, you know, the, the, the tenants, yeah, everyone wants to make sure that, uh, you know, they don't open too soon and cause that risk to their employees or, 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 or consumers. Um, so that, you know, I think, I think we're all probably uh, in the same boat seeing similar things like that. I think the real concern is, is July, August, September, when as a landlord, you know, the, the mortgage deferrals, you know, end, you know, are the banks going to push those out another 60, 90, 120 days? Um, you know, that, that's a question. The, you know, the federal government's support through the PPP was uh, helpful for a very short term. The additional idle loans by SBA have been a major problem and absolutely not sufficient for our industry, uh, for uh, food and beverage operators that are, you know, if there's, if there's additional federal uh, funding in the form of expanding the idle program. Uh, you know, I know there's a push for food and beverage focused uh, money there, but um, the, the idle program has been totally insufficient for the food and beverage operators that, you know, we're familiar with. So um, anybody out there with, you know, any, any ears of, of, of legislatures, you know, there needs to be some, uh, some additional assistance in the idle program and the SBA funding for, for the food and beverage groups. Thanks very much. Um, Tom, I'll, I guess I'll let you speak a little bit on the landlord side and then maybe ask Mark some of his thoughts on, you know, what he's hearing in the, in the banking finance community. Yeah. Um, we, and we actually partnered with Mark on some stuff already here. And as you mentioned, Clinton, we, we consider ourselves partners with our, our tenants, particularly our small business tenants, the retail and restaurant tenants. And we've had a mixed bag of, of uh, restaurants that are, successful or not. I look out my window and I can see one of them's drive through is just continually busy right now. They, they're doing very well with drive through Chick-fil-A is one of our tenants and they do, obviously everybody knows very well. But then we have some other small business restaurants that are really, really suffering right now. Some have chosen uh, not to reopen. Uh, as a former restaurant owner, I understand if you're limited to 25 to 30% occupancy, of your business and particularly if you don't have much drive through to me the only reason you're going to open up is to is let your customers know you're still there because you're going to be losing money and so i think it's a market share question that they, they think they can't afford to just close but the employee retention i was just emailing with one of our restaurants that was about to open in this area that this thing hit right when they were trying to open and um they just they're they're delaying their reopening because of re hiring employees, getting employees back. I've heard some talk about the fact that some employees can stay home and make more money than they would if they're working based on what the legislation that came through uh, had. But um, we're, we're in it. This, our landlord who I work for and represent is uh, in it for the long term. And we want to make sure that when it comes time to reopen these restaurants and retail establishments that as much as we can do, we can't do all of it, we can't do sometimes enough, but we want to do what we can to see that they're successful. We all need to be, it needs to be a win-win situation. And then the banks are involved too, and, and I know that um, the lenders are, are watching as closely as we are. So far, everybody's been working together very well, even our tenants that are going through a really tough time and truly hard stories. Um, they don't, they're not getting mad or frustrated, they understand, and my heart goes out to them because they are, they're, they're, um, their dreams of their small businesses are being crushed at this moment. We need some help for them, we really do. Uh, Clinton, uh, yeah, first, thanks for the um, opportunity to join the panel today. Uh, yeah, this is obviously unlike anything that we have ever experienced before. I know on the banking side, it first kind of felt like a Y2K experience. We you're preparing for something you've never experienced before. You don't really know how bad it may get or it is, will it be a non-event? And, uh, and then it felt somewhat like the Great Recession. And we spent a lot of time trying to help our customers. And so this, but this is totally unlike any of those two experiences. 
Um, so from a banking side, and, and Tom said it is, that, yeah, we're, we're, we feel like we're partners with a lot of the small businesses, and uh, I commend those small businesses, particularly the restaurant operators and, and hotels. Uh, the challenges they face are, are immense. Um, and so we are in this together. A lot of things that some things we've already talked about that the banking industry has done is uh, we, we stepped out there and did payment deferrals. Uh, most banks uh, looked at a three month payment deferral starting in April. So April, May and June uh, uh, deferring those payments, uh, full principal and interest. Uh, we also offered four months of interest only to those customers who uh, felt like they may not need a, a, a full deferral. They could pay the interest. So that was something else. Uh, that was uh, put out on the table and a lot of our, our customers have taken advantage of those uh, payment deferrals um, uh, and the interest only payments. Uh, we anticipate, yeah, at the end of June, what does July look like? Um, what were the small businesses, the challenges they face? I anticipate and I know there'll be a lot of discussion on do those deferrals, does that program need to be extended? And, uh, and so while no, um, uh, nothing has been decided at this point. I anticipate throughout the banking industry uh, that uh, they'll, they'll take some serious consideration in the looking at possibly extending those programs. And in the, as, as we all, there's a lot, been a lot of talk about the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, when this rolled out um, in early April, this was an immense, immense program. Um, for our federal government and the SBA. Uh, the SBA typically will, will process $28 billion a year in, in SBA loans. And uh, just the first round of the PPP program, they're looking to, to process 349 billion in a matter of days. And so it was tremendously challenging. A lot of uh, the system kept crashing. Uh, we had folks like most banks working almost around the clock to try to take care of our customers in processing those loans. Uh, and getting money into their hands so they could help make payroll and uh, pay for their rent and some other expenses. And so um, I'll say everything considered, that program has been somewhat successful uh, up to this point. Uh, but I do know um, during this time period, um, it has been, at least on the banking side, because of the uh, the delay in getting the guidelines coming out of that program. Um, you know, I've been doing this 37 years. This has been uh, one of the most challenging experiences from a banking side that we have seen. Uh, and, and, but I think looking back, it's going to be probably the most rewarding time in our careers and that we're able to step out and, and help our customers in a time where they desperately need it. And again, to repeat what Tom said, we're all in this together. So I think you'll continue to see banks be very cooperative, be, fle be very flexible, and uh, hopefully resourceful and creative in how we can help going forward in helping our small business customers. Thanks very much. Yeah, that's as you were talking the entire time, Mark, I was thinking, you know, I've been, I guess my business career has spanned I don't know, 25 years now. And, you know, the, the PPP loan may not be perfect, but I, you know, I don't think there's been a, a finer moment for regional banks. Like, I mean, yeah. what I've seen between, you know, from you, I, I saw you one afternoon, you were just yeah. exhausted, <laughs> glad to be out of the bank. And I talked to a yeah. lot of other friends that are bankers and, you know, I know they just have really been working so hard because there is a true concern for their, oh, yeah. for their, their friends and their, their, their customers in the community. So, just, so 2020 was probably the most frustrating, stressful, worked more hours in that month than any month of my whole career. A lot of anxiety throughout, throughout uh, the, uh, the banking industry. But again, when you look back, it's going to be the most rewarding time, I think, in, in, in our careers because of what we were able to do with very little guidance. Again, with the SBA, they rolled this out so quickly. And bankers like bankers are very structured. We're very regulated. We, we're very pragmatic. We like to know the rules of the game before we step on the field. So this really put us in our outside of our comfort zone. Um, but in a, in, a, in a way that we learned a lot about ourselves and uh, it forced us again to be resourceful and creative. And, and, uh, and so overall, um, we'll, we'll grow. The industry will grow from it. And uh, a lot of positives came out of it. 
Agreed. You know, and I'm sure there's going to be more work to do before oh, we yes. really can say we're, oh, we're yes. through this. So it's 2.30, and we have a hard stop at 3 o'clock, and I'd like to allow time for a couple questions. Um, so I, I think we're going to need to kind of speed things up a little bit, and I'm going to I'm gonna call a little bit of an audible here and, and maybe talk to, about something that's hopefully a little more enjoyable or kind of fun for us that's going to come out of this is thinking about. I think Ben may really engage with this, and, and maybe Tom as well. I'd be interested to hear from the restaurant guys as well. I mean, what are, what are our spaces going to look like going forward? Um, I, you know, we're changing now because we have to, and it's, it's not been any fun. Um, and it's, it's extremely challenging, but you know, the, the, the hospitality and the restaurant industry is, is to a major part. I mean, the last, we've spent a lot of energy trying to make it about the experience and, you know, the fun of that experience has really kind of been taken away a little bit and the necessity has shown up. Um, but my hope is moving forward as we come out of this, that we are going to find some creative ways to re-engage uh, with, with the, the, the shoppers, the customers, and with the restaurant owners. And, you know, we're talking about outdoor spaces. We're talking about, and Emily may, if Emily's still around, probably going to have some really insightful thoughts on this. But, you know, we're, we're seeing, we're already seeing cities and municipalities talk about, well, you know, Spencer talked about Miami, you know, closing a street. We're having conversations in Fable about uh, taking over parking spaces. I mean, I think they're happening across the country. It's like, okay, what we have right now is not working that great, and we're going to have to adapt. Um, so I think it's going to be fascinating to see how we do that, uh, and hopefully really enjoyable to see how we do that. Um, so... Uh, with that said, I'll, I'll let whoever's kind of got the strongest, excuse me, the strongest opinion go first. So jump in. Well, I guess I'll take a stab, and I think the short answer is probably nobody knows, right? So, I mean, a big part of what we do is um, try to create this space for those experiences, as you mentioned, and um, we're in a uh, you know, up until four months ago, we, we're in a world where people pay for experiences. It's, it's that it's a dining out, it's the live music, it's um, all those things that, that uh, are taking that priority of people's disposable income. And people still want that and crave that and need that. And so how, how the physical space gets redefined is, is, is a great question. I'm not sure any of us know the answer to that right now, but um, because we get through the next quarter and through this year and, and get a better understanding of what the real health impacts are. And as the data comes in and gets better and better over the next few months may uh, play into that. You know, I think as a building owner, I'm hesitant to make um, really any, any decision that's going to be a capital intensive decision in the change of a physical structure or patio or anything like that. Um, in a reactive uh, setting out of fear right now, today, right? So I think, um, you know, seeing how the rest of the, you know, the quarter, the next, the coming months, uh, and even into next year is going to be a big determining factor on that. Yeah, Clinton, I would say that it's almost too early to tell. We're still so early in this. I would echo those comments in that it's, it's too soon to spend a whole lot of capital on changing too many things because, just this week, the CDC came out and corrected itself on surface materials. So we've spent, I don't know how many millions of dollars across the country on wiping down surfaces, probably it wasn't as big as a concern. So, and, and that's something that should have happened because that's what we thought. And I'm not blaming the CDC. They're all learning as we go. So we've got a lot to learn and I think we're gonna have to trudge through this. There's not gonna be immediate response to the economy. I think that we're all going to be paying attention to HVAC systems, whether it be office or retail. I think be more air movement filters, uh, spilling air outside of a, of a building out to the outside. You're going to see uh, less touching for as menus. You'll see probably more apps on your phones for menus, as opposed to handing out a menu somewhere. You'll be hand sanitizers everywhere, but I think at the end of the day, it's going to still come down to blocking and tackling for what we do because there's certain things you just can't change. 
to the to the HVAC and kind of the the idea of this healthy environment. It's going to be interesting to see how that translates into to underlying value of the asset. You know, creating a healthy space, whether it's in a restaurant or an office setting or whatnot, has been a, always been a personal interest from ours. And you're always weighing the you know the kind of, the kind of cost benefit analysis of spending those extra dollars on better air, air filters and, and and all these other types of things. And it'll be interesting to see if the consumer demands that from the business owner, you know, if the business owner and the landlord are, are um, you know, willing to pay for those extra things that translates into higher rent, that translates into value, um, you know, from an appraisal standpoint and an investor standpoint. Um, and so some of those decisions are going to be interesting to see how they work out as well. Agreed. Um, Emily, do you, do you have thoughts on kind of what you're seeing in some of the other municipalities around the country or any, any unique ideas or, and I, Tom, I agree with, well, I agree with both you and Ben. It's, it's tough to say, I mean, it's very early, but on the, you know, Emily's kind of seeing things on the very front lines uh, on a broader, broader scope. So I'd be interested in your thoughts, Emily. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the Beer Foundation just partnered with the Aspen Institute to develop a guide to reopening safely. And it's a 13 point plan. And um, I'm not going to get into the whole thing, obviously, but a lot of it are very kind of low tech ways to enforce distancing for your staff and for your customers. So creating different stations um, for takeout and delivery just kind of separating them out so you don't have the people who are just working on takeout and delivery and people who are working in another area of the restaurant like prep or something so close to each other so creating distance in that way um, and then similar to what Ben was saying adopting you know new technologies get changing your POS system so that you can adopt cashless so eliminating cash altogether is something that people are talking about which you know might not be realistic for a smaller restaurant but it is the safest way to make a transaction. Um, so there's a lot of really good stuff in there on how to do that without, you know, some kind of major interior architecture project. Um, but that said, there are a couple of design firms. I mean, a lot of design firms that are out there that do restaurant design that are thinking about how we're going to be designing the interiors of, of restaurants going forward. So I don't think it's going to happen with existing restaurants right away, these major kind of construction projects, but for new spaces, um, I think it definitely will. And just something interesting about these HVAC systems and implementing new technologies and restaurants having to purchase PPE for their staff. It's like all of these costs that are associated with this stuff that that restaurants need to reopen safely. And even the minimum, you're, we're talking about kind of this major added cost is going to drive the cost of food up, ideally, because you have to make up for it somehow. Um, and we're dealing with a system where people are already kind of resistant to pay the true cost of food. That's why the part of the reason why the margins for restaurants are so kind of razor thin. Um, and so there's going to need to be a huge push, I think, on, on everybody's side to help consumers see the value of of dining out and the value of this food when, when going out to eat, which I know as I've been cooking at home for three months, I would pay a million dollars to go sit and have somebody make my meals. <laughs> we will certainly appreciate it in a very different way when we can get all go get together with our friends and have a, a nice meal. Um, that, you know, we could, we could take this in a lot of different directions and, and probably talk all afternoon, but I think a, a good segue from what we just discussed, you know, I heard a pretty common theme there, which is, is the cost. I mean, all of this stuff is going to cost a lot of money and the restaurant business is already a really tough business and reopening is not going to be cheap. It seems almost inevitable to me that the rent structure as we knew it is going to have to change. Um, have you guys uh, internally maybe been or Tom, I guess you could look at it both ways. You look at it from kind of the property owner side and, and I assume the restaurateurs are having the same conversations, kind of looking at, at it through their lenses. I mean, are there internal discussions about what rent structures look like going forward? Cause it feels like, uh, what we've seen in the past has to evolve in some way. 
I can talk a little bit about that just because we're currently nego we're, we're in the process of negotiating two leases at the same time. Uh, and the way we've always looked at it is how many dollars per square feet can we generate? So if we have 30% of the restaurant is kitchen and bathrooms and 10% is storage, how much income can we generate out of that 60%? And then it's always been not literally, but kind of like outdoor seating is kind of a throw in. It doesn't have the same value because you can't use it all the time. Uh, especially when it's hot in the summer and cold in the winter. But now with, uh, I think it's going to be a long-term situation where you've got to reduce indoor seating and restructure it so you have more room for everybody. So they're not as on top of them, uh, excuse me, on top of each other as they typically are. And the value you get from that outdoor seating is greatly enhanced as we've already seen. Uh, I think that to... In some ways, it's almost to where you would put less value on interior seating than we have in the past and more value on patio seating, especially if it's covered, uh, and exterior seating because you have more flexibility with it. Very interesting, and I agree with that, Tom. Uh, have you had any thoughts or discussions internally on, on maybe go-forward structures on your new spaces? Rent structure? Yeah, uh, you know, maybe I, I think you've been fighting the battles that are at hand, so you probably haven't been looking at some of those uh, deals coming down the pipeline in a, in a unique way. But I'm just wondering if you think that we'll see a trend towards percentage rents uh, like we see with retailers. Yeah, when you when you mention that, that's really that's the only place to go because we can't, you know, Mark's on the phone and he's going to want us to make sure we have enough rent income to cover our, our note payment. But um, we're going to... I hear you. I, I get it. I know the restaurants are going to have to have some relief somewhere. Not all, not all properties have high rent, but I've seen the comps out there and there's a lot of high rents that has amazed me over the last five, six, seven years and what restaurants are paying. Um, but I, I do believe there probably needs to be a refocus on percentage rent. We still have some older restaurant leases of some successful restaurants that we have that break point on the base rent, but then we have the point where they start charging, they start paying percentage rent. I think we're going to have to look at that again. Well, and I, you know, I certainly didn't mean to imply that your rents were high, but you guys have some very nice space, but I've always think you've done the, your best to rent them fairly. But you, Jamie and I have been having conversations about, you know, Jamie's wanting to enter kind of the more casual restaurant space. And we've been talking about, and he was just on the cusp of doing it. We've talked about what do you do now? I mean, you know, you want to move forward, but it's, it's hard to budget um, or figure out really what you can afford. And it sounds like if landlords are going to want tenants to move forward, there's going to have to be some kind of kind of shared risk structure. So I don't really expect anyone to have an answer. I just kind of want to throw that out for discussion. Uh, ben, have, have you guys had any conversations along those lines? You know, we haven't, uh, per se, we haven't had any tenants ask for that yet. And across the board, we're pretty much set up on a, you know, a triple net type setup with all of our tenants. And we don't actually have any uh, percentage rent leases uh, currently. Uh, we have, I guess we have talked about doing that on a temporary basis as they start opening back up. You know, if we have a tenant that's paying only triple nets there when they get back open, starting with a, with some sort of percentage rent and then going, getting back to their, uh, uh, initial lease terms, but uh, no, across the board, we haven't had any discussions about permanently restructuring the way we do our leases yet. You know, it, it may come to that if this, you know, depending on how things go the next two quarters. Sure. Well, we have a, a few questions and um, I'd like to give Wes a few minutes to kind of wrap things up. So I want to, but before moving to the questions, I just want to ask, are, are there any points that any of the panelists would like to make or anything that you, you want to discuss that we haven't hit on? If not, I'll, I'll go to uh, the questions. The first question came from Daniel, um, hence, and it was directed to Montine, but I'm sure he'd be interested in, in insights from anyone. And he basically said, uh, with the ability of restaurants to offer takeaway, adult beverages and food and, and other emergency le legislation implemented to support Arkansas hospitality industry, 
do you see these really incredible tools staying in place post COVID-19? Um, I hope so. Um, I can tell you that um, we've asked, we have beer and wine available now and I've put in an ask for specialty drinks, but um, I, I just think anything you can do to make, make um, our state more relaxed about alcohol and responsible drinking is good. So hopefully this will, will make a difference and we'll see if we can um, uh, make it stick with the legislature. Uh, but I think it's a good start. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there was a question from Jeff Cooperstein, and it, it says, is HVAC at all uh, similar to the trails in terms of, of monetizing? Um, I, you know, I, I guess I don't completely, uh, you know, the trails, we've seen, we've seen proximity to the trails locally, and I think this is, I can say this is a leasing agent, and I think it will really excite everyone on, on in this forum and ULI, and I think Ben certainly you know, he sounds like he's kind of built his business around, around this. We see it as leasing agents. Now tenants, they ask and want to know how close they are to the trail. Uh, they see the real value. Um, so I guess, you know, my, my, my answer to Jeff's question would be, I, it's going to be expensive, I think, to, to implement these newer, higher quality standards. But I believe that, um, you know, we deal with a very smart constituency and I think that they will start to realize and then they've got smart consumers. So I think that, um, as we've discussed today, some of these HVAC improvements, uh, health improvements, safety improvements, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to, to weigh the cost benefit on the, on the developer side. But I do think that, uh, it's my hope that, that the constituents and the shoppers see that and are willing to pay a little more for, to, to be able to engage with really high quality spaces. Um, and then Keaton, we have one last question and, and I'll kick it over to Wes to join and, and help us wrap up. But Keaton Smith uh, said that we know many small restaurants were challenged by PPP due to their high proportion of rent to payroll. What are the group's thoughts on food and beverage specific policy supports? What are the opportunities at lo local state and federal level? So that's a pretty big question. Um, I think all certainly on all of our minds, but uh, I, I think it would be interesting to know if anyone has uh, concise thoughts on, you know, there, I guess there were going to be, my thought is there were going to be businesses that uh, PPP worked well for and some that it just wasn't perfectly suited for and it had to happen quickly. Um, and I think given the circumstances, the government did a pretty, pretty good job. Uh, I guess that's my personal view. Um, but it certainly um, left some big gaps for the restaurant industry. Uh, you know, I think as a whole, it, it did okay, but the restaurants, uh, it felt like a miss in a lot of ways. So anybody want to have kind of some closing thoughts on what kind of legislation or ideas they may have that, that could be helpful and maybe attainable going forward? I can speak to that a little bit just on what we're working on at the foundation. I think, you know, PPP, like you said, has failed the restaurant industry in a lot of ways. It only is meant to last for eight weeks. The guidelines are really confusing, which means that even if you did receive a PPP loan, people are really afraid to use it. The business are kind of unclear. Um, and so I think there are a couple of organizations, including the Beard Foundation, um, that are working on this, uh, the IRC, which is you know a collective of chefs from across the country, from all different cities and um, different sized businesses that are working to lobby with their congressperson on a restaurant stabilization fund, which is really kind of just a, a restaurant specific fund. Um, and there are a few like Kwame Onwachi, who is a chef out in DC is working on that. So there are a couple of big names that are, are working on this stuff, including the Beer Foundation to advocate for um, immediate and restaurant only kind of funding for, for small businesses since so much of that PPP funding went to larger restaurant groups that first time around. Um, but yeah, a lot of work being done there. Well, and we, we haven't given up on the, the extension of the, the 
the weeks in the PPP and if they will extend that out and make the percentages go away too, the 25 and 75 percent, uh, that would go a long way in helping the restaurants. Hey Clinton, this is Tom. I have a question for Montine. Can I ask? Okay. Yeah, I believe she can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, you know, uh, kind of off subject, but it fits right up your alley. And I know a lot of us have this on our minds, but there could be a really big impact if, if we, if sports venues, the amphitheater here in Rogers and Little Rock, um, if, if, there, if fans are not allowed to travel for this season, and if it carries forward into the winter time for even basketball, that's a big, that's a big impact on hotels, restaurants, travel industry, things of that sort. And it's not only going to affect, in my opinion, restaurants uh, in those areas where people would tend to go to, but it's also going to affect local governments that fund their police and fire departments, mainly off of sales tax. Absolutely. If we can't open the big venues and have those events, it, it will affect the whole state. Um, so we'll just have to work on it and see how it it goes. Um, I know that there, there are groups of the large event facilities that are working hard on, on rules that they could abide by to make things happen. So we'll just have to make it happen. Another one of those wait and see. Yes. Mark, but did you we'll, have a thought you wanted to discuss? Yeah, no, I just wanted to chime in that, you know, the, the PPP program, $660 billion in the speed of which it was uh, released, it, it, a one size does not fit all. And that's what we're finding. And that's what we're getting feedback on our customers. And the restaurant business is a good example where it is not going to benefit them. As, as much as it would uh, some you know, manufacturers and so forth. And so I think it's going to be imperative that the, 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 all the banks, all the local banks work with their customers on a case by case basis to see what makes the most sense and try to extend some type of forbearance uh, so that we can help customers on a case by case basis. These federal programs are great, but uh, typically it's hard for them to really be customized to the individual small business owner. So for that to be effective for the banks, we must also have the regulators and they've already provided some leniency, if you will, but they've got to play a part in this as well. And they've got to step back to some degree and let the banks help the customers. And it kind of goes back, we have to all be in this together um, uh, for it to all work. Because we all know short term, this is gonna be extremely painful. We know that, uh, but I do feel like long term, uh, we will learn a lot from this. Each of these industries will, including banking. And, and you use the term that uh, necessity is a mother of invention. It will force us to change the way we do business in a lot of, in a lot of industries to where long-term will be much better. But short-term, no doubt, it's going to be extremely painful. And uh, we've got to be able to work together, uh, at least from the banking side. We have to have the ability to work on a case-by-case -case basis with each of our customers. Um, because again, these programs, one size does not fit all. So. All right, well, I, it looks like we're getting close to, to running out of time here. So Wes, if, if you want to chime in and, um, and we'll kind of ask for any last thoughts and then try to try to wrap this up. But I can say, and I think I'm, Wes will echo this, a sincere thanks to all of you for being on the call uh, and all the attendees. Uh, it is certainly a very tough environment. Uh, no one could have predicted this, but it, it is encouraging to see kind of the entrepreneurial spirit uh, that we, our peers and um, people in this industry have. So thanks very much. Yes, I echo Clinton. Thank you to you all. Thank you, Clinton, to facilitating this conversation. Uh, very topic, uh, topical, very relevant, very timely, and uh, certainly on, on behalf of the entire ULI Northwest Arkansas membership and our friends from Oklahoma and other states and regions that have joined us here today, um, thank you all very much for your contributions here. I have no doubt that, uh, that your input here um, will, will better shape the decision makers in their own professional capacity um, and those of your peer and fellow industry professionals. So. Um, Finally, we'll, uh, we'll get her closed out here. 
and uh, we'll wrap this thing up. So to Spencer, once again, um, Spencer, thank you. I, I know he's probably gone. Uh, fabulous presentation. Big thanks to our audience for joining us today as well. We could not do this without you being here, obviously. Um, I encourage everybody to come by the ULI Northwest Arkansas webpage at uh, arkansas.uli.org and learn more about the programs and events that we have planned and also the benefits of ULI membership. Uh, we depend on members, the, the, member, the, the commitment of the ULI members in order to provide value, valuable content like we did here today. Thank you for considering ULI Northwest Arkansas as one of your premier professional networks. You can also find us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And if you ever need anything from me, you can definitely access me either through the website or one of those three social media channels. I'm pretty easy to find. I try to be on every single day. Um, one final thank you, and, uh, and we hope to see you at a coming event very soon. The next up will be uh, an attainable housing round, uh, round table with uh, housing professionals from the Northwest Arkansas region. That's next Wednesday. And then into June, we're looking at a transportation event similar to this focused on, um, on mass transit, in particular the Ozark Regional Transit System and launching a women's leadership initiative here in Northwest Arkansas. So we encourage you to drop by the website and learn more about those. Once again, thank you. Wish you all well and safety. Take care.